Hi there, I'm Katie and I'm back with another episode of Leadership Theory Discussion and I'm joined again today with Chief Adam Hoffman of the Bruce and Brennanville Volunteer Fire Department. Adam, thanks for joining again. Yeah, welcome back to Firehouse again. Of course. Welcome back everybody joining us online. Of course. So today we're going to talk about something we discussed a little bit in episode one where I think you and I both said that we were kind of servant leaders at heart. And this was before we kind of in, in, adventured into our journey into other theories. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that we just thought, you know, based on our involvement here, that we had servant leadership styles. And I know I just had that based on what I understood that as, is um, just a kind of community-based, service-based industry. Um, <clears throat> so, Servant leadership is a lot like transformational leadership, which we discussed last episode. Mm -hmm. um, and the key difference here with servant leadership is actually just the extension. It's still the, the, the focus on values and, and keeping the vision, mm -hmm. but it's extending everything out into making a difference in your community. And, you know, could there be a better way to go about leading a fire department? Yeah, no, I, I think I've been looking forward to this one because I think this is where most fire service leaders end up, uh, and I would put myself in that category, or, or, I, or at least I strive to be in that category. I'm sure we all fall short at some point. Um, one one big difference of, you know, as I think about this is that some of these theories have been um, tools to get to, you know, good leadership, uh, and then some of them are more attitudes, and this one's a way of being. It's an attitude. It, you... you are a servant leader. It's not something you you do, right? And we have, and I think that's um, it comes pretty naturally, like in the fire service, because we're here for a service oriented function. So that you know it, it, that leadership um, tendency shows itself a lot, I think, in the fire service. Sure, and and just to define it for everyone, servant leadership, you have the shared vision of you know what it is exactly that you want to accomplish, and then it kind of flips the pyramid of hierarchy on its head where you aren't delegating everything, but you're actually trying to figure out what the people need and want and fostering everything from the bottom up. So you're kind of in the trenches with them, identifying different things for them and helping them grow. And I think that it's a great parallel to all the other theories because, you know, a part of this theory is you know, behavioral, you want, you want to be a role model. So, you know, it's that acute awareness that people are watching you and that they're modeling your behavior. And so you have to kind of be, you know, doing that thing where we talked about the bell curve, where you're looking at people at different stages in their skills and different stages in their motivation. And, and of course the skills approach where you're, you know, constantly identifying what people's skills are and what their needs are and what they want to grow and helping with that. And then of course, path goal and spiritual, where you're looking at keeping that motivation up and then lastly, I mean, even authentic to, you know, just be open and fair with your membership and with your community mm -hmm. about um, being transparent about what your goals are, what your needs are. Um, and I think that, that that wraps it up perfectly with, with all of those different tools. Like yeah. You said. yeah, absolutely. I think, I think a lot of those are tools and this one is more of an attitude or behavior. And mm -hmm. uh, this... I think servant leadership becomes really naturally in the fire service because as we kind of talked about with competence, technical and tac tactical competence, we, I, I, I've never met a fire chief that wasn't first a fireman. Mm. I, I've never met one. I'm sure somebody somewhere has tried it. Uh, so don't, don't throw a bunch of hate at me for saying, <laughs> Oh no, they're out there. They, they, they probably are, but I don't know any, any that were not first a fireman and they were first, a fireman and then a good fireman and then a junior officer and then a senior officer. Right. And so being in the trenches is what we do and it's something we enjoy. And so it comes pretty naturally for most fire chiefs. Now, granted, as I get older, I, I find that uh, I want to be in, in house fires and doing that, that sure. hard work, you it's know, physically that's harder, right. Uh, as you, as you get a little older and, and I'm sure that's going to continue, but uh, they, you know, most chiefs relish at the opportunity to, you know, go back to get to play on the fire ground and get to, you know, 
put some real work in, right? Not that leadership isn't work, but it, it is definitely a different kind of work. So I think it comes naturally to us because I enjoy it when I get to get it to be a fireman and one of my other officers has got it and they're, they've got it under control. And I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm not taking anything. You have a good time and, you know, take care of it and you're doing great. And I'm going to go grab that hose line or, or whatever. And, and so, um, it fosters that, you know, that spirit, I think in this fire service, it comes kind of naturally, but the, there's so many parallels here. And I think with the other leadership theories, and I think you, uh, have to take some of those tools to be an effective servant leader. And there are some downsides to it. And, and, but you know, you, if you, if you use some of those other tools, it'll make you more effective in that. And I think a lot of us start out that way, but then we don't really know how, where to go from there. And that becomes the downside is that you're like, Oh, you don't have any. Okay. So then I'm a servant leader. Cool. But I don't, I don't know actually apply that in a lot of ways. And and it it ends up being a lot of trial and error, I think. And you, you find some things that work and you definitely find some things that don't. Right. Uh, (laughs) But the more you learn about the other theories, like, Oh, okay. I understand that path. Okay. the, The amount of support that I need to give or not give. And right. And there's a, there's a lot of tenets that go into um, the servant leadership theory where there's, you know, active listening is a huge one. Mm-hmm. Right? You're just, just not always just listening to respond, but listening to hear and, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and empathy. And, and there was a little bit about a work-life balance of, and I know I can, I can relate to this with, you know, just the burnout that you have sometimes with tons of fundraisers. And I know we're planning, um, the auxiliary's planning because we have a we have a fair coming up. It's called Good Neighbor Days, and it's a it's it's only a day or two long. It's not very long for the community, but it is a very long week for us. Mm-hmm. And we you know lots of cleaning to do, lots of things to set up, lots of hard work on hot days in the, in July. And you know I uh, the the group has gotten together, <clears throat> firemen included, and kind of came and said, what can we do to make the the weeks after that a little bit less like I want to kill you. Yeah. So you know we kind of bounced around one of the firemen actually came to us and said, you know, what if we do like a wellness day? Mm. And, and I, and I talked to everybody and we're like, well, this would be really great to do after good neighbor days when everybody just wants literally to kill each other. And they don't want to see the firehouse. They want to be near the firehouse. They've been there every day. And, and that kind of work-life balance where, you know, as a leader, I wanted, I brought to them the membership as they brought to me, like, how can we make this wellness day happen? How can we give back, not just to the community, but to to our members too, and and show them that we appreciate them. And just knowing and trusting that, you know, they're putting a lot of work in here, you know, and there, and there's other tenants too, and that's mental and physical health. And, and, and that ties into spirituality. And, and this is, that is, I think one of the, the big downsides of servant leadership is that, and you see this in the clergy, you see it in, burnout. you know, public safety, fire, EMS, law enforcement, uh, you, this is not a job. This is a calling. This is right. something that you feel, um, pulled to do. And generally speaking, I don't know anybody that's not at least a little passionate about doing this job. Sure. And so, you know, you come passionate about something you want to do all of these things and you need to do all of these things. And you can really quickly put yourself in a position that, uh, you don't have any free time <laughs> and you're, and you don't have uh, any rest or relaxation time. The family time can suffer, sure. especially, you know, when you're talking about calls and late nights, sure. you know, meetings, we don't, you know, we only fundraise here, to keep the doors open. You know, we're not turning a profit or anything in our business, obviously, but, but adding those things, the fundraising on top of already kind of a stressful job and you know there there are downsides that go with that and as a servant leader if you're if you're doing it that way it, it can heighten that burnout right because we're it's no longer the ceo coming in very aloof and and not you know not working the line so to speak and 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 it, when you're doing essentially you're you're contributing to both the leadership roles and to the technical aspects of the job. And so maintaining that can be very time consuming and very stressful. Sure, and, that, and so that does lead to that, some burnout. That calling piece too, I find with myself and I can see it in at least my members and I can think I can mm-hmm. see it in yours too, is there's this obligatory feeling that you have to go to everything mm-hmm. because if you don't, then who else will? And why are you going to ask 
why would you ask them to come to something you're not really comfortable with? Because right. that's the mindset. Right. It's like, right. we, you know, it's hard to say, like, well, you know, I was going to go out to dinner with my friends that day, but, you know, somebody got off sick, so I think I need to, to show up because otherwise, you know, these other people are going to have to do that. And they're not getting paid for it, and they're giving up their time and their family time. And, and you know, the same thing with calls, you know. When when do you say no? I'm I'm not going to go on this. One. Yeah, and, and how you, do you, help you do, your members identify that? Right, and you do have to protect that. yourself, and you have to you have to learn to protect your people as well, or try to to foster that. It's okay to not be here for everything. Of course, we want you here. Of course, we love you and want you here. Mm-hmm. And in a leadership role, you feel I think even extra pressure to be here, and that is true. I will never ask any of my guys to do something that I myself won't do. Mm-hmm whether that's been raising or running into a house fire, but the, you know, at some point you have to say, okay, there is, it's not a limit of what I will ask of them, but there is a limit for me personally and what, how many hours are in the day and how many, how many days in a week. Right. So I, I have to occasionally say, you know, I, I'm just, I'm going to go take care of this other thing tonight. Uh, and or, or take some take some time to rest tonight and not go on that call or not go to that thing, and so and that can be a really you know as a, as a servant leader when you feel that way it does lead to a feeling of guilt right for sure, um, and that's another you know downside of that you can get way too involved and lead to that burnout but you do have to find some space for yourself and then you have to keep an eye on your people and make sure that they have some space for themselves and they're not sacrificing too much to you know, for the cause, right? Yeah, and I, I had a, one of the members yesterday, we had a meeting yesterday, and, and one of the members called me about an hour, uh, one of our officers called me about an hour before the meeting, and she said, you know, Katie, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to the meeting tonight. You know, my, vet, my dog's at the vet, he's not been feeling very good today. And she's like, I really want to talk about this stuff. And like, I, I could tell you, but it's probably just easier for me to do it. And you could tell that she wanted to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was like, I'm going to try to make it. I might be a little late. And I was like, you know what? why don't you just join virtually? Like, then you can stay home with your dog mm. and then you can get out what you need to say. And if you have to go, you can go. And like, yeah. it's not, a, and, and sometimes I think it's just listening because, you know, honestly, if she didn't want to come because her dog was sick, that would have been totally fine. But I could hear in her voice that right. she had things that she wanted to bring up at the meeting right. that were important to, you know, we only meet once a month. So, um, so I, we came to that compromise kind of on the fly. And I, I think that was a good decision. She seemed okay with that. And you know, she was cuddling with her dog on the virtual. Yeah. And, it, and it's just about that balance. And Technology and has made some of that easier. Like, yes. has made some of that easier. Easier for and sure. harder because but you're then, also available all the time. Right. right. <laughs> Quote, unquote. Uh, but the basic principle of that is the same. Right. Sometimes it's, you know, and it's okay to not be. And I think a lot of those, a lot of leaders um, struggle with that. It's okay to not, not be there all the time. And, right. and you don't need to feel guilty about saying, now that can't be all the time. You do have to be around and you do have to, you know, put in the work and know your people, but you, you know, it is okay to say, you know, it's just been a really long day and I just need to be at home <laughs> or, or whatever that is or whatever that relaxation is for, for you. Right. Um, I, I think the, one of the hard things about servant leaders is they're called to a leadership role and love to get your thoughts on this. The call to a leadership role without much experience or skill in being a leader. Oh, yes. And so you are, um, I don't want to say thrust into that role, but, but, it's a, that, it's but that maybe sometimes that call, it is. Feeling though, back to that call, right. I'm feeling is that you feel obligated. Like, I feel so much passion for this. I know I can do it. I'm so motivated that I, I mm-hmm. if it can't be anyone else, it can be me. Mm-hmm. Because I... Mm-hmm believe in the mission. I believe in the people. I'm surrounded by people who, who share the vision. And, and for me, that actually happened to me. We lost, I think I mentioned this in one of our other episodes. We lost one of our, we lost our president at the auxiliary last year because she had a baby and life happened and she's very busy. And, and she was like, Katie, she came to me and she said, Katie, I think you're going to be the one. And for her to come to me and say that was like, whew. Well, I mean, who am I? Like, she's sure. great. She was an amazing. She's just the pinnacle of servant leader, just mm-hmm. always listening so actively and always offering advice and always making sure that there's that work-life balance balance and that vision. Um, and so for me, for her to come to me, and like you said, and we've said on previous episodes, it's like always training your replacement. I didn't realize that she was kind of giving me 
mm-hmm. things here and there along the way where Tools she gave and projects me projects to work exactly. on, things to learn from. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And she was building me up. I hadn't realized it until I was, like you said, thrust into mm-hmm. the position. And then, you know, with that passion, I took that as an, a great honor. Mm-hmm. And I decided to do the best I could with it. And, you know, it's, again, oh, not awesome. not always easy. But, you know, yeah. taking this the, a leadership class is one mm-hmm. of the things that I was prioritizing just to see if I could, you know, improve my skills. Hopefully with that. learn some things. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And I think that <clears throat> kind of ties in nicely with the other theory that uh, we have this week, which was the authentic leader mm-hmm. part of that. And we talked briefly about that. I, I find it. It's interesting that authentic leader theory because you want to be authentic, but when you take a leadership role, some things need to burn away from you, right? Parts of your uh, personality need to go. They need to leave, right? And not be present Mm -hmm. because we have bad parts of our personality too. And so I think that's where a lot of people struggle with their authentic leader is knowing which parts to burn off and which parts to keep. And maybe we overcompensate too much or, you know, we all can grow and, and certainly I'm, I'm, I'm not done learning. I hope I'm not done learning. And so with our authentic self, we have to find, stay true to who we actually are. But we, but often I think leadership calls out a better you than you've been. I couldn't agree right. More. And so you have to learn, you know, what, what your faults <laughs> are, what your tendencies for disaster are, whether it's, you know, short tempered or, I tend to talk too much and listen too little or uh, whatever those things are. You have to learn which parts of that authentic self need to go and which parts need to stay as part of as the good parts of your personality. And then admit to, you know, one thing I think that is really important for that authentic self and for the servant leader, both theories, you, you have to admit to where you're not good and you can't, you can't fake it. You can't fake it. And you say, you know what? Like sometimes I suck. And, and, you know, sometimes I suck and I'm, I try to be better and I'm working sure. at being better every day, but I don't always get it. And so humility, yes. But and also, owning that, owning those mistakes, right. And, and showing your folks that, listen, I'm not perfect. And if, and if you're looking for perfect, anyway. I, I ain't me, I don't know where you're going to have to go shopping, but, right. but you're not going to get it but here. Also, and so we're, also, we're going to go through our difficulties and grow together. It fosters also though, this awesome being transparent like that. Also, mm-hmm. also fosters this great opportunity to grow skills in your members. Mm-hmm. So they, mm-hmm. you know, for me at least, where I fall short, there are others who are well, well exceeding my skills. Yeah. In, and I'm just thinking of just silly things like, like when we do children's events, I think I've mentioned in the past, like, that's just not my deal. I don't have kids. I've never really been around mm-hmm. kids. I don't know how to do it. And, and I'm like, I don't know how to do this, but I want to help you with whatever you need because you're really like, not you, but right. my member is really good at it. And whatever I can do to help support mm-hmm. her and, you know, do do some ordering, organize some things, you know, do whatever I need to do and let her excel. Yeah. And we haven't talked much about this, but I think that's a really important part about building a good team. The finding people's, finding people that complement your weaknesses mm-hmm. and complement your strengths. So, you know, if you say, okay, I'm, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not great at the detail oriented planning things out in a, in, in that kind of way. So we bring, you know, we, we find somebody who is good at that and we foster their leadership skills. Who's interested in, and meets the other qualifications, but that's how you build the best team is you need, you know, you have to understand everybody's strengths and try to delegate what, for what people are passionate about and where their strengths are and understand your own weaknesses and, and either work on improving those, which is which is certainly necessary, but also understanding that those are your weaknesses and accepting that and not letting your ego get in the way and say, oh, I can do it. I can do, you know, no, it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to do everything and you can't be great at everything and, and there's no reason to fake it. Get your person that is good at it and, and support them and help them and hopefully learn along the way for Exactly. Yourself. And if you're in the trenches mm-hmm. with them and you're using the active listening skills, then you're going to be learning things that you're not great at. So you're also improving your skills in that way. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's, it's just a good thing for everyone. And then alongside that transparency, I, I know here, and I don't know if this is true for other departments. I think it probably mm-hmm. is. And you can speak to that. Um, having that transparency with the community, not mm-hmm. just as a 
not just because we're a tax-based entity as a volunteer department, but also because we have to have their trust, mm -hmm. not just because of the funding, but because of the nature and the relationship we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going mm -hmm. into their homes. We're of course. helping yeah. them on the worst day of their life. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, so you need to have that. You need to foster that, that trust and relationship for sure. Is mm -hmm. just incredible, and and I think that's one thing that we do a good job at here, where you know, not everything we do is for profit. And, yeah, no, and you know, right. sometimes you're you go to a school and you'll talk to the little yeah, kids absolutely. about what does a fireman do and why are they cool and why you should be one or. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we'll do things here for the kiddos where, or for the adults where it's just, it, we we don't necessarily make money off of it, but they're coming and they're building relationships with us and we're building relationships with our community. Absolutely. And we deliberately, so at our core, our, our mission is not profit, not for profit, right? We're not, we don't, we do bill insurance on, you know, fires or car wrecks or whatever, but everything that we do that involves money is simply to keep the operation alive sure. and we don't get paid. We don't have, um, you know, the newest, nicest equipment. I think we've talked about that, but, but we keep it running and everything that we do that is billable is, is only to keep the lights on. And so everything that, you know, our primary mission is service oriented mm -hmm. and we do a lot of events, whether it's events or calls or, um, you know, tours, that kind of thing for the school or for the scouts touch or for whoever, touch a truck for the, the kids. And, you know, to want to, to, to show the community who we are, let them meet us, see, you know, and talk to us about what our needs are and, and what we're doing and, and then get the younger groups right. and passionate that, and involved, and you know, or interested at least. Right. And this also right. goes back to, you know, building a, an organization that, you know, you're not going mm -hmm. to be leading the whole time. So building mm -hmm. that relationship with the community, building that relationship of course. is, you know, fostering new members, new ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've gone to touch charts at the school and come mm -hmm. back with a new member. Absolutely. From a dad. Right. From a dad and or from, down the road, you'll get a kid who knows, later. you might get a kid later. You know, yeah, absolutely. Spark that interest and that's kind of that sustainability of just knowing that it's not always going to be you and you have to trust your team. Yeah. And, and well, you're always wanting to grow, right? You're always looking for good people. And so if we can find that, no matter where we can find that. I think that's a, that's really important. And, you know, when we, we talked about Good Neighbor Days, our community festival, we're adding in some mission specific things. You know, obviously it's it's at least partly a fundraiser. It's also kind of a community fair, but we're also adding in mission specific things. Like we're going to demonstrate how we get people out of a wrecked vehicle. We're going to do some live fire demonstrations and things this year that are mission specific for us as well, that are good community outreach. And so, all of this at its heart is community service at the end of the day. Yeah. So <clears throat> you've been involved in fire service for a really long time and you've been involved with several different agencies in different mm -hmm. parts of the country and the state. How would you say that the majority of leaders you've come across in both fire and EMS are service, service leader oriented or how would you yeah. think the ratio is? In, that? Uh, in the fire, fire service, especially the volunteer fire service, I definitely think that's true. That's that be the, you know, probably primary mode of leadership in the fire service. EMS is much the same way. I think it it um, generally you start to, you see at least the good ones are servant leaders, uh, and that's not all encompassing. There are definitely other other folks out there, and and there are some tyrants. You run into those occasionally, but for the most part, I think you see servant leaders. And I think when leadership struggles in public safety, it's because they're servant leaders that don't have leadership tools. Mm -hmm. They've not really been taught or, or, or learned not in those had, had to write how to be a leader. And, and a lot of that in the fire service and in, our, in public safety as a whole, a lot of that is I was brought up by somebody who was a good leader. I was taught how to do that by a good leader or followed their example of a, of a good chief or whatever. So you know, whether they knew they had, whether they knew they were learning the tools or not, sure. they were emulating those and being raised in that right. as, as and, and a good one, leader. One of the issues with emergency services is there's not a lot of money to put into furthering education, especially in yeah. 
leadership mm-hmm. and communication stuff. I mean, right. it's like, okay, well, yeah, like, what we really need is like rope training. We right. really need extrication training. Yeah. And and that stuff's really important to the immediate goal, but there's not a lot of extra money, especially, you know, somewhere mm-hmm. like here mm-hmm. to do that. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this podcast yeah. is just to bring awareness to these different theories and, and, and we, different ways to go about leadership. And we do require our officers to take, uh, we call them the fire officer classes and fire officer one and two. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit of leadership there, but it's a lot more about the nuts and bolts of the, like the administrative side of the fire service. It's a lot less about leadership theory and how to be a good leader mm-hmm. and a lot more about how to make schedules right. and how to do fire reports right. and how to do pre-planning and, and all of that's important, but I would like to see more leadership in there sure. and, and less you know, how, how to learn Excel. Right. And, and, and and so they're valuable in some ways, but I think that's one of the things that a lot of our firemen from those classes, they come away feeling like, man, that could have been, it's a somewhat of a missed opportunity that they, they learned some things, but they didn't learn maybe the most important things, which is the, which are the, at least in my humble opinion, the leadership, like anybody can learn to, to, create a schedule in Excel. That's not that hard, but learning leadership theory is a, is a lot harder on your own. Right. Uh, and so, and there's, you know, I guess a few, few, a few more YouTube videos out there on it, but there aren't that many, you know, Excel, you can find anything on, on those kind of programs. So I, I would like to see more of that. So we do require that leadership training, but it is not comprehensive leadership theory. Like, you know, we're trying to maybe foster here where we're giving some more of that. And I would love, I'd love to see more of that. And I don't, I don't see a lot of that even at the national level. Uh, when you look at like FDIC, there's a large instructor conference. that's national that held every year in Indianapolis. I didn't see a lot. See a lot. It, it, well, there's a lot of technical and there's some, some fire theory and tactics and some of that too, and some leadership, but a, a lot of you still don't see a ton of leadership theory and, and I'd love to see some more of that because I think that's really valuable. I think a, a lot of our folks could benefit from that. Yeah. So I, I have one more kind of, this is kind of an not abstract question, but so servant leadership works really well when we're talking about day-to-day function here. So just like mm-hmm. our mission and our goal and our training and our fundraising and all of that. But you know, this type of leadership doesn't necessarily work well in a military-like setting mm-hmm. because, you know, you kind of have to have that authoritarian quick, like, you do this, mm-hmm. you do this. So when you're on a scene, do you find that the leadership style changes oh, yeah, away from servant mm-hmm. leadership because mm-hmm. of that fast transaction? Mm-hmm. There's really not time mm-hmm. to sit down, sit down and sing mm-hmm. Kumbaya and figure right. out what everybody wants to do. Mm-hmm. So how exactly do you handle something So that like becomes, that? So, so you don't... It's dynamic. It is dynamic. And it, it, you, you, but at some level, not all the time, not on every scene, not on every call, but eventually do have to become an authoritarian. And the servant leadership part of that at the firehouse and on, you know, the routine, the routine emergency calls, if that's a thing, um, you know, routine fires, routine car wrecks, that servant leadership builds the foundation for the, the, and the training for the authoritarian leadership when that needs to happen. Right. So so my guys realize that, hey, he's serious. You know, sometimes it's just, we're doing this, 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 and this, and these, in that order, and, and exactly this way. It and it has to be that way because it, it, you know, somebody has to make those tactical decisions and we don't have time to do it by committee. So sometimes it needs to be that way, but I think the servant leadership when it doesn't have to be that way, sets the foundation for the trust that's needed that, sure, you know, and cause we're asking, you know, not, not dissimilar, dissimilar from the military, we're asking our folks to put themselves directly in harm's way. And so that requires a significant amount of trust that the leadership decisions are being made correctly. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that I'm, that I have their best interest mm-hmm. in mind to get, get the job done and, and keep them safe. And so you foster the ability to do that by what you do here. Sure. And so when I get out on scene, I hope, and, and you know, they trust that I'm making all the, you know, that I'm making good decisions. They also have enough trust to question me and say, wait, I'm seeing this other thing over here. 
you, you know, did you see that? Yeah, I saw it. Okay, good. Okay, I just want to make sure that you had factored this other thing in. So that trust, you know, goes both ways. And I trust them to tell me when I'm, you know, if, there's, if they see something or that I'm making a mistake. But sometimes it, in that, but that's the minority of time, right? That, right? Most of the time, uh, we're, we're doing it the other way. We're going from the bottom up. Mm-hmm. But that lays that good foundation that if when you have to come top down, makes sense. that it, they trust you to do that. And they expect that. They expect that, you know, that's part of the deal. You know, you, somebody has to be, somebody has to be the guy. Uh, whether it's me or one of the other officers or one of the senior friends, somebody has to be the guy that makes, makes the decision, you know, what we're going to do. And, when, and you, when you train in that setting, though, with the servant leadership kind of in the background, when it's not an emergency where you're, where you are talking about, you know, what's the best way you can do this and talk about the line and mm-hmm. a couple episodes ago, and, mm-hmm. you know, you train to, so maybe the foundation, like you said, mm-hmm. there's a foundation in that servant leadership. Yeah, of course. The trust kind of comes out when it becomes more authoritarian. And it's still yeah. kind of dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you build all that trust in the day-to-day stuff here. And the non-emergent, that's where that all that comes from. And the servant leader, I think, actually really helps that. And, and maybe is even key to that. Sure. Now, there is a downside with the way things can work here. You have to be smart about how you do that. So, you, you know, it's... The, the chief can pick up a broom and sweep the floor, right? That's okay for him to do. The guys don't like it necessarily because they're like, wait, he shouldn't be doing that. But that's part of like being a servant leader. You're not too good to sweep the floor. You're not you're not too good to wash the truck. That's that's part of your job too, just like it's part of everybody's job here. And you know those basic housekeeping functions or whatever. Mm-hmm. But you have to make sure you do that in such a way that you're helping the team. And it doesn't come across as you're micromanaging or criticizing that Absolutely. it's not done. Not so, so that is a, correct. So, so it has to be. I'm pitching in where wherever help needs, wherever we need to do it. That's where I'm going to be. That's where my hands are going to be busy working, mm-hmm. but not in a. Well, nobody else. Is uh, nobody else going to sweep the floor. So I guess I'm going to sweep the floor, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the wrong way to approach right. it. So you have to. You do have to kind of be careful with that. Right. That your doing that bottom up the right way that yeah. you're not micromanaging not of your that attitude and your behavior correct and that you're you're shipping in at whatever is the work is not in a humble way not in a humble way honestly. correct and and a and a that i'm actually, i'm just one of the guys so you i'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the criticisms of the theory mm-hmm. is that you know some folks who don't value servant leadership mm-hmm. um can can kind of find this to be a little bit condescending can be micromanaging. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we have that problem here because, you know, everybody that walks through the door is typically a servant leader at some level or servant mm-hmm. at some level. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that we have that problem unless, you know, you come across as condescending in some way, mm-hmm. which, you know, we, I don't ever see that here, but. Um, well, you can, and it's not that hard to do, right? Sure. If you, if you're not, you have to make sure you're approaching things sure. the right way. Sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one last piece with that. I think when you're, it it can come across as very awkward that, you know, the head of an organization's mopping the floor, whatever organization it is, if, if you're not used to being in a servant leader environment. So if you come from a business environment into like a fire department and you see, you know, the chiefs out there sweeping the floor, the guys are just hanging out BSing and you're like, what, wait, I thought, that's my boss doesn't do that. Right. So that can be kind of weird if it's yeah. not an environment you're used to. I, I can see our, our folks here quickly get used to the yeah. fact oh, that yeah. like we all pitch in and we all work and we all help, but it's, um, it is different if you've never sure. yeah. been in that environment where, yeah, it's just normal that, you know, the president washes dishes. Of course he does <laughs> just like everybody else does. Right. right? And, you know, and so it, if you come from a business environment somewhere like that, that is not that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, even the military fosters this. Mm-hmm. You ever heard of the top three breakfast? Mm-hmm. No. So this is something that the military does. And I, I love this concept. They, uh, you know, annually or, you know, whatever interval, they do what they call top three breakfast. And that's where the senior enlisted folks, right? So your, your, your chiefs, your senior chiefs or master chiefs, Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll get together and that's the top three, right? Well, the guys with all the stripes, they'll actually cook and feed all the troops. 
So they're actually serving and feed. They cook the food and serve all the troops. So they still have some of these tenants. And, and so, right. Well, but that, I think the reason they're doing that is that helps them, again, that they're the guys that are going to be giving the orders on the battlefield, right. but they're cooking the breakfast, they're doing the dishes, and they're, and they're serving the food. And, and that is a, a great, I hate to bring it back to that, like, foundation for that, but that's exactly what they're doing. And it, it really is very smart to incorporate some form of servant leadership into whatever environment you're in. The fire service office is very heavy, but there are opportunities in the business community too. Absolutely. You know, there is no reason that, you know, your, your boss can't go and, you know, perfect example, you know, the, you maybe have a, a an office administrator, somebody who, you know, works a, a welcome desk or whatever. And, you know, things have been busy and she hasn't gotten a lunch yet. There's no reason the boss can't sit down and answer the phones. Like, for 30 minutes. Right, for 30 minutes. Not all day. He's got work to do, but there's no reason he can't be like, hey, why don't you go go eat? Sure. I'll take care of this. Mm-hmm. That's a great example of maybe just an opportunity that I think a lot of a lot of supervisors, bosses at some level would miss. Mm-hmm. An opportunity to be a servant leader and say, hey, no, I got this. You go ahead. Mm-hmm. Right? Or, hey, I see you're covered up. Can I – let me take this thing and take care of that right off your plate right something that's you know menial even right and just do that thing right very insightful conversation tonight thank you so much thanks for for coming back here again and and we'd love to hear your thoughts on all of this and if you have any criticisms or or anything you do in your own day-to-day please leave it in the comments we'd love to hear yeah absolutely thanks thank you see you next time